Poison dart frogs are maybe one of the most unique species of amphibian in the entire world. Super popular, but super misunderstood. So today, let's go over all about dart frogs and why they're so awesome. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wicked's Wicked Reptiles. Stick around. I love dart frogs. If you've been watching the channel the last few months, this is of no surprise to you at all. And I think we're gonna break this video down into three categories. Why they're so awesome, the care, general care requirements anyway, and then what kind is best for you. Because with dart frogs, there are several different kinds. So let's just jump right into it and talk about why dart frogs are so freaking awesome. Well, it's pretty simple. Dart frogs are tiny. They're little, which is great because you don't need a great big space in order to house them. And the housing requirements aren't that difficult for most people. And not only that, but if you want a different dart frog than your friend, well, you can definitely have that because there are so many different colors. There's blue ones, there's yellow ones, there's green ones, orange, red, there's so many different colors. And a lot of these colors like blue are very rarely found in nature. Find something blue in nature. It's very difficult. And you're going to get to enjoy those colors because these guys are diurnal. Diurnal just means these frogs are active during the day, which is amazing because a lot of animals, especially frogs, are only active at night. So if you want a captive animal, if you want a pet that's going to be able to be viewed in the daytime, moving around rather than just sleeping, dart frogs are amazing for this and they're active. So it's not like they'll just be out sitting there. Dart frogs hop around and it is so fun to enjoy. It is so adorable as well, but it's also distracting. I came down here an hour and 15 minutes ago, hoping to start filming immediately, but instead I, I came down here and I watered them and cleaned off the glass. And by that, I mean, I stared at them for like 45 minutes because I just can't not come down here and look at them. Of any animal that I personally keep, the most fun ones that you don't really handle, but are the fun ones to watch, in my opinion, dart frogs take the cake. And some of them are even fun to listen to. If you get something like a Dendrobates pumilio, you're going to hear these things calling 100%, no doubt about it. I remember last week in Costa Rica, these things were hopping around everywhere. It looked like there was just Skittles on the ground, these red Skittles, and you could hear them with that beautiful call of theirs. And in captivity, if you're looking for something that is not too loud, not annoying, but makes them sound a beautiful noise, well, there's a lot of dart frogs that would be right for you in that scenario. Not only that, but the barrier to entry isn't crazy. They're not that expensive to buy if you want something that's a little bit more common. We're gonna go into the types of dart frogs a little bit later, but there are common ones that you can buy for 30 or 40 bucks, but of course they do get up there into the thousands as well. It just depends. And their setups, because they don't need to be massive, are really fun and easy to set up and not super expensive either. And the maintenance is super cheap. Oh yeah, and the enclosures, if you do it right, and by right, I just mean the way that I do it. So if you do it the way that I do it, let's say where it's bioactive, it's going to be beautiful to look at. It'll be like a piece of living art in your home. And that's why I love dart frogs. Not only are the subjects of the art moving, but the background of the art is living, it is changing, and it is absolutely beautiful. I can't believe like that was actually coherent the way I described that. First time for everything. To be honest, I could do a whole video about why dart frogs are freaking awesome, but let's move on to our second category here, care. Now, this is not going to be a care guide. I will do a care guide on different species if you want. Let me know in the comment section below leave a like, that's how I know that you want it. But in general, if we're taking the families of Dendrobate, which is what this family is, and it's broken down into several subsections and several species, several genre, then it's kind of similar, depending. In general, and do your research before you actually get a species. If you get a Dendrobates azurus, or if you get a uh, Galactinatus, or whatever you get, research that specific species. But in general, if I had to put everything with a blanket, paint it with a broad brush, they like it humid and they like it warm, but not hot. And by that, I mean, in most cases, you're going to want around 80% or higher humidity, and you're not gonna to wanna to get too warm either. Most dart frogs, the common ones anyway, are going to like it mid to high 70s, maybe low 80s, 
but don't get much hotter than that. A lot of dart frog species are considered terrestrial, and just to bring it up one more time, not as a flex, but just I still can't believe I got the opportunity, in Costa Rica last week, we saw tons of different species, tons of species of dart frogs. Most of them during the day were on the ground or just a few, maybe a meter up, three feet or so, above the ground in a bromeliad or on a leaf or on a log. So they're not gonna be up in the canopies. They're not gonna be up in the trees like a tree frog is what I'm trying to say. But in many cases, they will use a little bit of height. So if you have the option, don't just give them plain ground and nothing else. They can climb the glass, but what I do is I give them backgrounds, kind of like these artificial rock backgrounds that I've either made or made for me or come with the enclosure, plant something like bromeliads in the back or different plants. And I see this, especially with my Dendrobates erratus, they will be up, up almost near the top of the enclosure, which is 18 inches tall or about 45 centimeters up in the air. And they're gonna be in these bromeliads, which is exactly where I found them in the wild. So to me, that means that I'm doing it right. And speaking of care, you can actually have several different individuals in a tank together in a lot of cases. There are certain species like Dendrobates erratus or the Leucamelas or the Azurus where you can keep them in groups pretty well. I wouldn't recommend different species in the same enclosure. There's there's a whole bunch of different issues with that. But if you wanted to keep a Leucamella tank and you had a bunch of different, of these are the bumblebee ones, and you had a bunch of them in there, as long as it's an appropriate size enclosure, you can definitely do that. And a lot of different dark frog species, you can actually go have things like morning geckos with them as well, which is fun because then you have a diurnal species and a nocturnal species, which means that the subjects of the enclosure will be moving all the time because you have several and they interact during different parts of the day. The last thing I'll say, although you want it super moist most of the time for most species, offer dry things like tree branches or logs or leaf litter. That's something I noticed as well. There is leaf litter all over the parts of Central and South America where these guys are from. And I'm talking about like, up to your ankles sometimes in leaf litter. So that's something I will take away after seeing them in the wild. I will put more leaf litter in my Dendrobates enclosures. At the end of the day, we wanna keep dart frogs in captivity as similarly as we can to the way that they are found in the wild. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Right now, we just took a reading. Mike Tatula is taking readings the entire trip here in Costa Rica. Out in the wild, we're finding things like this, a granulated dart frog. It's in the Ufaga species. And right now, it's about 86% humidity, and it's 80 degrees. These guys are going to like it. Most dart frogs like it. High 70s don't go too far into the mid-80s for sure. But the thing is, although that's the reading here, we're in a bromeliad with a little pool of water and around it's just lush grass. So they're going to be able to escape that heat and stay very moist. So that's why I suggested keep your enclosure very moist, but give them leaf litter so they don't get foot rot or anything like that. They have a place to go that isn't completely soaking. Ufaga are an obligate egg eater. So basically the tadpoles eat infertile eggs, which is really, really cool. I think these are an amazing frog. If you want to know more about Ufaga, head over to my friend Diane's channel at Reptiliatus and Mike Tatula, he's got a bunch of them as well. A very cool species, but let's head back to the studio. And lastly, what kind is right for you? Now, it might be the case that none of them are right for you. I know a lot of people that are my friends who live in places like Arizona is a great example, or parts of California or Texas, where it is just so dry and they have a hard time keeping moisture into an enclosure. There are ways around it, but if dart frogs are right for you, you've done your research, you decided you're gonna get some, there are many different species. And all dart frogs fall into this family right here. And there are many different genres, many different subspecies, and there are about around 180 to 200 species in general. But the really common ones are things like Dendrobates, which are what you find in my collection, a lot of them anyway. There's some Ufaga, which are really cool, just difficult to find in Canada. There's things like Philobates, uh, Renenemea, also the thumbnail dart frogs, the really tiny ones. And there's a bunch of other ones as well. But these are kind of, in my opinion, from what I see, the more common ones. They're all kept relatively similarly, but they're super fun quirks. Like we talked about with the Ufaga being obligate egg eaters before in the last section. There's just some things that make them different and all of them come in different colors and different patterns. So I guess the things that you're gonna to wanna to watch out for are how big of an enclosure do I need? Do I want a small dart frog? What kind of color do I want? Do I want something that's gonna get big, like a Philobates type species that can eat things like kind of small crickets? Or do I want things that are only going to eat 
fruit flies, which is what they eat, by the way, which kind of adds to the cheapness because you can easily go ahead and make your own fruit fly cultures. Flightless fruit flies, don't worry, they won't start flying around your house. And of course, each individual species has individual requirements. So again, I'll say it, I will beat this dead horse, Make sure you research each individual species before you actually get one. All in all, if you're somebody who wants to look at a heavily planted bioactive enclosure and you want a species of animal in there that can interact during the day or be active during the day, I should say, maybe even have a small lizard species like a morning gecko inside of there as well, and they're super active and easy to feed and fun to watch, there's really nothing that beats out a dart frog. And by the way, I should have said this earlier, Poison dart frogs are not poisonous in captivity. They're completely harmless to you. Don't eat your frog. I'm not recommending to eat your, I'm actually recommending you don't eat your frog. But if you did, it wouldn't be the poison that kills you. It would be eating raw frogs, which is bad for you. If you have any questions that you want to explore further, drop them in the comment section below. Let's have a little bit of a conversation about dart frogs. Do you like this video? Let me know, should this be a new series all about whatever animal? And let me know if you want a series like that, what species should we do next? I would like to say thank you if you've made it this far. If you've watched the video, hit like, hit subscribe, left a comment, anything that you've done to interact with the video, I appreciate it. It does so much for this channel. And as always, a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. You guys are freaking amazing. Without you, it would be so much more difficult to do cool trips like Costa Rica, which you guys get first dibs at the pictures and the videos, extra content, merch, all sorts of different things. For as little as a dollar a month, you can be part of the Patreon club too. I'd appreciate it. So would Diamond and all the dart frogs were ribbiting earlier and I'm pretty sure they were saying, they like, okay, this is silly now. Because I do videos twice a week, that means that I'll see you on Thursday.